Okay, thank you all for being here and for joining us on Zoom. My name is Sandy Baird, and I am here on behalf of the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. That was the original name of Burlington College. And we are trying to keep some of the traditions alive of Burlington College by having uh, political and social and cultural events which educate the public and encourage them to become civically engaged. And tonight we're going to do a little history of what are called the Negro Leagues. And we have a number of guest speakers to talk about baseball before it became integrated. And it became integrated with Jackie Robinson in the 50s, correct? 1947. 1947, excuse me. With us tonight are uh, Tom Simon, who is an old friend of mine, and he is a lawyer, a Burlington lawyer, but he's also a baseball historian, and he can talk about some of the books that he has written about baseball. With us also tonight is Bill Lee, who is a pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, for the Montreal Expos, and now I hear he is a pitcher for the Burlington Cardinals, which I didn't know anything That's about. That's Tommy's fault. Right, <laughs> Tom Simon's fault, that is. And Carl Lindholm who it will explain himself, because I just happened to meet him. I think he is a Middlebury professor, correct. That's so absolutely. we are going to start with Tom Simon, who will tell us a little bit about the Negro Leagues and in hopes of educating all of us about the integration of baseball many years ago. So here's Tom. Thank you, Sandy. Um, thanks for having us here. Um, Tonight, this is going to be a crash course on the history of the Negro Leagues, or to be more precise, it's actually going to be a crash course on the history of blacks in professional baseball. Um, I don't consider myself a specialist on uh, the Negro Leagues, but fortunately, um, we have a true Negro League scholar seated right here to my left, Carl Lindholm, who has taught several courses on the Negro Leagues at Middlebury College and has written extensively on the subject. So uh, Carl didn't know he was going to be up here with us uh, as, as a speaker, but as he walked in, we dragged him up to the front where he belongs. And, uh, and Bill, Bill really embodies the spirit of the Negro Leagues. Um, he's kind of the closest thing we have to a modern day Satchel Page. At age 74, still pitching um, just as almost as well as he ever has. I think so. And <laughs> so, uh, so and, and, and also um, a great student of, of the history of the game. So we're really fortunate to have these guys with us. Here's my game plan. Um, I'm going to go over um, four takeaways that I've learned about the Negro Leagues since I've been inundating myself in baseball history over the last 30 years. And um, actually, a lot of the great scholarship on the Negro Leagues has occurred in the past 30 years. So by going to Sabre conferences and by reading all the new books that come out, um, I've you know, kind of kept up on, on developments. So even though I may not be quite as nuanced on the history of the, major, of the Negro Leagues as, as Carl might be, um, I have a pretty good sense of, of, of the history. And so I thought we would focus on my four takeaways on Negro League history, and as we as we address each of them, I'll kind of give an overview of, of my point, and then I'll, I'll let these guys comment before we move on to the next of my four takeaways. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. Um, so takeaway number one, uh, Jackie Robinson was not the first black man to play in the major leagues. Now the first thing we have to do is define what we mean by the major leagues. Um, because there have been a number of blacks who have played professional baseball in the minor leagues, um, but, but um, the, the, the first man to play in what we considered to be Major League Baseball was a fellow by the name of William Edward White. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he was black, he went to Brown, and he played for the Providence Grays. So we have the color spectrum right there. Yes. <laughs> And, and what's interesting is that prior to the year 2014, nobody in the world would have said that William Edward White was the first black Major League Baseball player. And that's because back in 1879, when he made his one and only appearance in the Major Leagues, he, he did not consider himself to be a black man. He, was, he, he considered himself to be white. And I think if, if people had known he was black, he probably would not have gotten this opportunity to fill in. What happened was, 
He was at Brown University. He was the star first baseman on their collegiate championship team. And the Providence Grays were a good National League team. And their regular first baseman, a guy by the name of Joe Start, broke his finger. They needed a replacement. They needed someone who was local and could jump into the lineup quickly. And there, there was William Edward White, who filled in for that one game and went one for four. Um, what's interesting about William Edward White, though, and the reason why that nobody was aware that he was actually considered a black man um, uh, under the laws of the time is because his father was white. His father was a G Georgia businessman, and his mother was one of his father's black, uh, mixed race servants. So technically, that made, that made um, William Edward White a black man. Um, and so um, in 2014, thanks to the incredible uh, research of Peter Morris, who's a Sabre member and, and does incredible research on, on um, you know, early baseball. He discovered that, that, that William Ever White was under the, you know, under the, the laws of the time, and I, actually a black, black man um, who played Major League Baseball in 1879. So I was actually saying that, you know, what do we mean by Major League Baseball? So um, the first league that we consider to be Major League can I just interrupt for one second? Who's that sound like? Anybody know Vermont racial history? Who does William Edward White sound like? Twilight. He does. Mm -hmm. Alexander Twilight, the first black college graduate, Middlebury College, 1823, I think. Wow. Well, he, the, the Middlebury is having a period, I'm not going to go on and on, but I love it, just, it. it just struck me that there's a period of reevaluation because it would appear that not, there's nothing outside census records that says that his father, was a black man. There's nothing in any contemporaneous literature that identifies Twilight as black. So it happened. So he may have been what's called passing. Yeah. And so we don't know. But Middlebury is having this reevaluation because we had a fellow named Martin Freeman, who was a very prestigious black man from Rutland, who was uh, president of a college and lived in Liberia for a while. So anyway. It's it's a I think an interesting parallel. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, but no, no, please do. That's that's what that's what you guys are here for. Um, so the the first major league is can is one second yes. speakers. So the folks online in Zoom can only hear you when you're speaking. When anyone else in the room, including the gentleman on either side of you, speak, the folks in Zoom can't hear you. Oh, okay. Well, that's too bad. I'll just repeat everything I just said. <laughs> Kidding. Red truck to green truck. Okay, okay you know, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll pass. If this yeah. is the one mic that, that goes to the Zoom feed, I'll just pass it around. Yeah. That, was, that was better, thank you. Okay, so, so the first major league, the first league that we considered to be major league was the National Association that existed from 1871 to 1875. That gave way to the National League, which started in 1876 and of course still exists today. Um, but then in 1882, um, a league came along called the American Association, which existed only until 1891. Those are the three 19th century major leagues. And um, so there were a number of black players in minor league baseball. In other words, in leagues outside of those three that I just mentioned. The most prominent of them was a fellow by the name of Bud Fowler, who made his debut in minor league baseball in 1878. And one of the many interesting things about Bud Fowler is that he was actually born in Cooperstown. Mm -hmm. So, uh, wow. you know, it's funny, Cooperstown, the so-called home of baseball, which really wasn't the home of baseball, but, uh, but one of the first prominent black baseball players actually did come from Cooperstown. And a few years ago, I was at the dedication ceremony in Cooperstown when they, when they uh, renamed one of the streets outside of the ballpark, Double Day Field, after Bud Fowler. So uh, anyway, the, prior to 2014, people would have considered the first black major league baseball player to be a fellow by the name of Moses Fleetwood Walker, who played in the American Association for the 1884 Toledo Blue Stockings. And later in that 1884 season, he was joined on the team by his brother Weldy. So those were the, you know, the, uh, the two first black major league baseball players until we discovered William Ever White's one game in 1879. Um, so what's interesting about Fleet Walker, uh, he was with the Toledo team the year before they became a major league team. It was essentially the same team, but they were playing, and uh, it, was, it was before they joined the American Association. So he was playing for the minor league Toledo Blue Stockings, 
And in those days, it was common for major league teams as they would travel around the country to fill in on off dates with exhibition games against minor league teams. And on one occasion, the Chicago White Stockings, now known as the Chicago Cubs, were coming through Toledo and they were going to be playing a, an exhibition game against the Toledo Blue Stockings. And the White Stockings were captained by a fellow by the name of Cap Anson. Ooh. And Cap Anson, um, one of the things that I think is kind of funny about Cap Anson is that uh, he, if, if any of you are Simpsons fans, he's um, uh, Mr. Burns, the, the, the cold hearted um, uh, nuclear power plant owner. <laughs> He, he said in one episode that Cap Anson was his favorite baseball player. <laughs> I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, very appropriate. That is amazing. Cap was the number one racist of his day. Yes, and so in 1883, when his white stockings were coming to play Toledo, and Cap Anson knew that they had a black man on the team, he said, if you play that black player, we're not going to play this exhibition game. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the manager of the Toledo team said wasn't even planning on playing Fleet Walker. Fleet Walker was a catcher. And in those days, it was common for catchers not to play every day, um, alternate. And this was going to be Fleet Walker's day off. But when Cap Anson made that edict, he said, oh, yeah, well, we're going to put Fleet Walker in the outfield. And either you suck it up and play the game, or you're not going to get your share of the gate receipts. So Cap Anson, yep, he ended up going with the money. And they ended up playing that exhibition game that year, 1883. Then the following year, 1884, Toledo is now in the American Association and along comes the Chicago White Stockings to fill in a date, an open date on their travel schedule. And they're gonna play another exhibition game against Toledo. Different manager in 1884 for Toledo. Anson again says, look, if you're gonna play those black guys, we're, we're not gonna play. And this time, uh, Toledo went along with that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about it though, is that at the time, Fleet Walker was hurt anyway. He had not played for two weeks. So curious to know whether he would have played that day regardless. I mean, it looks like he probably wouldn't have, but you know, they ended up playing the exhibition, exhibition game without Fleet Walker. And, uh, and so uh, Cap Anson had his way in that particular circumstance. Um, now, that was considered to be the beginning of the so-called gentleman's agreement where the teams in organized baseball all agreed that they would not allow black players to play Major League Baseball. Um, but uh, Walker may not have been the last black major leaguer before Jackie Robinson. And that's because there was a fella by the name of George Treadway, who was an outfielder for Baltimore and some other teams in the National League from 1893 to 1896. Treadway claimed he was Native American, but it was rumored that he was actually black. In fact, it was in the newspapers that George Treadway was a black, black man um, and passing himself off as a Native American. Um, so he lasted for three or four years. There were rumors that when he was finally released, it was because of these rumors that he was black. Um, but, uh, but even after the, uh, the, uh, the so-called gentleman's agreement, the International League, which was a minor league at the time, and still is, um, continued to openly employ black players. In fact, uh, there's a Hall of Famer by the name of Frank Grant, who played um, for Buffalo in the International League from 1886 to 1888. But in 1887, the International League ended up grandfathering the blacks who were already in the league, um, but, but saying that they would allow no additional black players to join the league. And once again, it was Cap Anson who played a role in, in um, the uh, segregation of the International League. Uh, the White Stockings, once again, had an open date in their calendar and they were gonna be playing Syracuse of the International League, which employed uh, two black players at the time, a pitcher by the name of George Stovey and Fleet Walker had, had moved along to the Syracuse team by this point. And Anson made his usual request that, uh, that none of the black players be in the lineup. And once again, Syracuse went along with it. And later that same day, the International League issued its edict that it would not allow any additional black players. Was it just coincidence that that day was the day they decided to, to put, a, put a stop to that practice? 
Probably not. It would appear that Cap Anson had something to do with that. So that's why Cap Anson, I guess, is Mr. Burns' favorite baseball player and is kind of reviled to this day. But in his era, he was really baseball's first superstar. He was, um, he was, he was just a you know, phenomenal baseball player and just not much of a human being. All right. Any comments from you fellas on that? Of no. course. All right. Let's hear them. Very quickly. Uh, Frank Grant was a great player. He's in the Hall of Fame. He still has the highest batting average ever in the International League. Uh, he's born around Williamstown, Mass, too, I believe. I didn't right down know. there. Yeah, he's a New Englander. Um, the only other thing I'd mention there is uh, the parallel. I consider the study of baseball to be parallel with American history in many, many ways. And uh, you'll note that uh, re during Reconstruction, we had black congressmen, we had, you know, the, the country was integrated in significant ways, albeit unharmoniously. Baseball was the same uh, for the first 15, or eight, 15 years after the uh, 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 Civil War, baseball was an integrated sport. Again, it was not a great life uh, uh, for black, black folks. The only other thing I'd mention is the very first black, all black professional team was a hotel team made up of great players uh, called the Cuban Giants. We're going to get to that. See okay. You. Well, okay. Don't worry. You didn't have a chance. I to just saw Grant Ricky down there. I said, no, okay. Don't worry. We're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, any, any so that was the point. Of, and then I consider Moses Fleetwood Walker the first black major league player. I think William White is a footnote. Yes. So. Wasn't there a guy in Philadelphia that got killed? He was a black ball player back then. Even before that. Yeah, I think you might be thinking about the guy who founded the Pythian Club yeah, the Pythian. in the 1860s. Yeah. So that was not, they, they were not a pre professional. They kind of predated the professional oh, yeah. era. In fact, the first professional team is considered the 1869 Cincinnati Reds. So in the 1860s, the Pythian Club, um, you know, was, was a great powerhouse black team out of Philadelphia. Actually, maybe, all black, I, though, right? yeah, yeah, all black. Actually, were they from Camden, New Jersey, or were they from Philly? There was, a, there was a number of those teams. Yeah. They tried to organize into a league, and it didn't last. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that, too. <laughs> All right, so anyway. Um, so guys, let me jump in one more second. I think maybe it's the microphone on the computer itself that's picking you up, because when you move that mic stand, it's not making it better. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then we won't yeah. even worry about that then. We'll just have to all we'll do sign language speak up screen. and do sign language, yeah. Which I don't know. All right, so takeaway number two. One's a fastball, two's a curve, wiggles a change. <laughs> That's the only sign language I know. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> Take, curve. Takeaway number two. Branch Rickey was not the first white man with the idea of reintegrating the major leagues. Now, of course, I say reintegrating because, as we've just discussed, Fleet Walker played in the, in the major leagues back in the 19th century. Um, in 1901, John McGraw, who was then managing the American League's Baltimore Orioles, brought a black player by the name of Charlie Grant to spring training and tried to pass him off as a Cherokee Indian by the name of Chief Tokohama. Um, only problem was, Charlie Grant played for a very prominent team in Chicago and was well known in Chicago, and, and Charlie Comiskey of the Chicago White Sox knew exactly who, who he was. And, uh, and put the kibosh on, on passing him off as a Native American. So that was the, the chief Tokohama uh, experiment. Now, one of these guys who could have been Jackie Robinson many decades before Jackie Robinson has a local connection. In 1905, it was reported that the National League's Boston Doves were interested in signing a fellow by the name of William Clarence Matthews, a Harvard student who was then playing in the Northern League for the Burlington team right here at Athletic Park on Riverside Avenue, spinning distance from where we sit right now. And, um, and you've probably seen the historical marker, or at least I hope you have, on Riverside Avenue, right by the turnoff that goes down to the Intervale and um, Gardner Supply that talks about Athletic Park. Um, and, uh, and I'm not gonna say much about William Clarence Matthews, because we're happen, we happen to have the world's leading expert on William Clarence Matthews seated right here next to me. So I'm sure he'll comment on that once we move on, uh, when, once I finish my kind of overview of this subject. <laughs> now, um, Bill Veck, the legendary owner of several major league teams, he's kind of, you know, 
he's known as being uh, quite a character. He was the guy who hired Eddie Gaydell to make a pinch. He was the, the, the midget who made the pinch hitting um, appearance. Uh, and, you know, he was the guy who came up with the exploding scoreboard at Comiskey Park and, uh, you know, all kinds of, of innovative ideas to try to make baseball more fun. Well, he claimed in his autobiography that back in 1943, he had a plan to, pre to purchase those perennial losers, the Philadelphia Phillies, uh, cut all their players one week before the season was to begin and restock the team with a Negro League all-star team that almost certainly would have brought the Phillies their first pennant since 1915. <laughs> Unfortunately, at least according to Vex's story, he gave word of his plan to Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis, Ooh. another notorious racist. Mm. And the next day, the National League took over ownership of the Phillies mm. and later sold them for less than half of what Vex had offered for the team. So, uh, so that, that put the kibosh on Bill Vex's plan. But just think about what the 1943 Philadelphia Phillies would have looked like if he had been allowed to, wow. to do that. Why, why he, he told Landis. Yeah, well, so he kind of needed Mountain, he needed Landis's permission to purchase the team. Well, he must have known he was a racist. Well, yeah, I don't know. He must have been, I think there's some real question about whether any of this ever really happened. <laughs> yeah. um, this was Bill Vec writing his autobiography in the 1960s, I think. So. To be an owner, you have to have two-thirds of the owners vote for you. That's why Ernie DiBartolo couldn't have the Cleveland Indians, ended up with the 49ers, because if you had a racetrack, it was illegal. But if you were John Kenneth Galbraith and owned racehorses, it was okay. So that's the difference. Well, Vic, yeah. I, I, he, he said in his autobiography, and it got into many black baseball histories, that he attempted to buy the Philadelphia Phillies in 1943. What's in doubt was how extensive that attempt was. I think, given Vex's history, 10 weeks after Jackie Robinson, he introduced Larry Doby mm -hmm. into the major leagues. Mm -hmm. The first black player, second black player overall, first black player. So Vex was clearly, and he was patron. He was the patron of Satchel Paige. So he had, so I, I, I take he at was face value that he, he would have done it, had he been able to. Um, and what Vex did was uh, he, he allowed another person to take over the ownership of the Phillies from the fellow who was willing to negotiate with uh, Vec. Mm -hmm. But it's an important, uh, an important moment because the other thing is, Branch Rickey decided to bring in players one at a time. None of the Negro League players or teams ever thought it would be that deliberate, one at a time, throughout for 12 years till the Red Sox had a black player. They always thought a team would come in the Kansas City Monarchs, that's the way leagues are expanded. By yeah. a team? Sure. So they thought a number would come in. So that's a little controversial. Vec wanted to bring in a dozen at one time, again, according to Vec. And Ricky has this elaborate plan with sociologists and identifies a particular individual, Jackie Robinson, to integrate the game. Meanwhile, he's got Roy Campanella in the minor leagues for two years. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And the Red Sox, Pumpsy Green was not the first black signed by the Red Sox. Did you know that? Earl Wilson. Wow. But he was in the minor leagues and they brought Pumpsy up first. Yeah. And then Earl got banned, supposedly for nothing. And people don't realize that Earl Wilson was one of the greatest hitting pitchers of all time. Oh. And he was first president of BAT, baseball assistance team, mm. which spread money around to players that were having trouble, you know, and he was a great man. He played about 10 years, right? Yeah. He was great. I mean, wow. Great no People in New England might be interested to know that Jackie Robinson actually had a tryout with the Red Sox in 1945. Ooh, and? that ended poorly. And he wasn't good enough. The Red Sox determined he wasn't good enough. They didn't get back to him. <laughs> Sam, Sam Jethro was on that. Yeah, he also had the uh, same trial, right? And Clemente. Uh, okay. They wanted Clemente Later. too, but they were... Also, right? Clemente? No, Clemente was Puerto Rican. All right, so any, any, uh, any further comments on this particular subject? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, William Clarence yeah. Matthews. Yeah. William Clarence Matthews has uh, been a, a real interest of mine. And uh, 
he was the best college baseball player in the country in 1905. I think I, I'd say I, I say that without I think fear of contradiction. Black player playing for Harvard. Harvard had a very for the time had a very open attitude about black athletes. Certainly wasn't true of Yale and Princeton, etc. Yeah, but it was true of UVM. And he was yeah. yes, and he was born in Selma, Alabama and went to Tuskegee Institute and was sent north by Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. to, to study in order to come back to south to teach. So he went to Phillips Andover Academy wow. and then studied at Harvard. And the reason you won't know much about him playing for a black team is because he had a Harvard education and he was, went to law school and the black teams like the Cuban Giants, they led a hand to mouth existence. They were itinerant ball players and he had a better future. This was true in white baseball for a long time, too. If you had a good job, you didn't play baseball. That's right. So Matthews is a fascinating figure. And if you'd like, I could, I'll talk to you for three or four hours out here. <laughs> yeah, someday, hopefully, we'll be able to read your book, your biography of Lady Florence Matthews. Oh, yeah. Uh, was, that, was that the extent? Well, the other thing, John McGraw was the greatest manager in the history of the sport, many argue. A real winner around the turn of the century. He was, he was just a... Uh, uh, Irish immigrant kid, no education. Uh, his great player was Christy Matheson, of course, who was very educated at Bucknell. But McGraw was an avowed appoint, uh, 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 opponent of the color line. He tried to sneak this Indian Charlie Grant on the team, and he took his team to Cuba, and he had Matheson learn his famous fade away from a, flip, a Hall of Famer black guy Cuban named Jose Mendez. So McGraw's kind of an interesting, interesting complicated figure. Yes, Thank he you. is. Yep. Okay. Further comments, Bill? Yeah, it's like blazing saddles. We'll take the blacks and the Puerto Ricans, but we won't take the Irish. <laughs> that's why Mel Brooks is a genius. <laughs> and that's true. That's right. That's right. All right. My third takeaway on, um, from my last 30 years of, 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 of interest in the Negro Leagues is that even before the Negro Leagues, blacks had their own leagues and even their own professional teams. So I think it's, it's fair to assume that black people have been playing baseball probably as long as white people have. Um, the first game we know of between two black teams took place in New York City on November 15th, 1859. Keep in mind that the Knickerbockers were supposedly inventing the baseball, baseball in the 1840s. So, you know, this was fairly early on. Uh, in 1887, and I think this is what you were alluding to before, Carl, um, the Minor League National Colored Baseball League was formed. Mm -hmm. uh, this was within the, the, the bounds of organized baseball. This was a real professional minor league, but it lasted only two weeks huh. because uh, there just wasn't much public support for it. They weren't able to make ends meet. Uh, but two years later, 1889, the independent outlaw um, Middle States League had two all-black teams in their league, the Trenton Giants and the New York Gothams. And even though there were no successful attempts to form an all-black professional league until 1920, uh, there were plenty of great black professional baseball teams. The first was the 1885 Cuban Giants. Now, their players weren't actually Cuban, uh, but they barnstormed around the country and advertised themselves as Cubans and even spoke gibberish on the field to make themselves more attractive to prospective white customers. <laughs> um, this was the beginning of the great barnstorming tradition in black baseball. And, uh, you know, that's a tradition that continued all the way up until the 1980s and um, was the subject of the movie The Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings back in the 70s. Now, because the Cuban Giants were at least marginally successful, in other words, they made enough money to continue to exist, they had many imitators. The Cuban X Giants, which were a, a break off of the Cuban Giants, the Trenton Cuban Giants, the Philadelphia Giants, the Brooklyn Royal Giants, the New York Lincoln Giants, the Atlantic City Bacharach Giants, the Chicago Columbia Giants, and the Chicago American Gi Giants, just to name a few. Now, what's up with naming all their teams Giants? That seems a little strange. And uh, I learned at a Sabre conference that the reason they would do this is because as these teams would barnstorm around the country, they would take out advertisements in the local newspapers, and Giants was code for, this is a black team. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So people who were reading the newspaper would see that this was the so-and-so Giants, and they would be like, oh, okay, this is a black barnstorming team. Unless, of course, it was the New York Giants, which was you know, the most prominent Major League Baseball team at the time. Yeah. Louis Tion's father was a left-hander star in that league and played for that Cuban okay. New York. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, he was Louis Tion, and his father was left-handed. And that's why Louis loved me, because he thought I was his father. Because you're left-handed? <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, oh okay. yeah. So what was the audience like for the black teams? Well, yeah, you're not, you haven't done the Negro Leagues yet. Quite early, you oh, so do you, let's talk about the audience, though, yeah, sure. um, for these black barnstorming teams, yeah. you know, back at the turn of the century. So these guys used to come to Athletic Park. The Cuban Giants used to play there a couple of times every season, and they were the biggest draw in Burlington. And it was, I think, probably predominantly and maybe right. uniformly a white crowd right. that came to see them play. In, uh, in, the, in Middlebury, there's the Sheldon Museum, of local, local history museum. In their vault, there are seven broadsides, three by four feet, New York, I mean, sorry, Cuban Giants, this is in the 1890s, versus Middlebury College. Really? Yeah, they played, played at Middlebury seven times in the 1890s. Against a white team, then. Against, Against Middlebury, Middlebury College team. Yeah, right. And then where did they go? From Middlebury. To Burlington. Right? Oh, they played it. UVM. Yep. The, Cu- mm. the, Cu- the Cuban Giants. And who was on the Cuban Giants? This fellow Frank Grant was on the Cuban Giants. This p- pitcher, Stovey. Who was who? Uh, uh, who we've already talked about. These guys played yes. professional ball. And then there was a third Hall of Famer. Uh, so he's not a, another Hall of Famer in addition to Frank Grant, named Saul White, who came up here and played on the Cuban Giants. These were the very best black players immediately after the lot, the color line was drawn, and they're barnstorming all along the East Coast, playing Middlebury College, playing UVM. So when was the color line drawn? 1887. After Reconstruction? 1887. Okay. Right? That you, yeah. We agree yeah. on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it was at the same time as Jim Crow? Yes. In the it, South. That's the right. parallel. Right. Okay. And Jim Crow was primarily for the North because the South was integrated. The Jim Crow laws were at, as prominent in the North as the South. Except de facto. They weren't. Uh, th- th- this was the biggest crowd of the season every no, year. I've done a lot of I've done a lot of reading. Uh, right. Two things, real quick. Yeah. Uh, in all that I've read, accounts of the games in the papers they're very small. Yeah. Condescension. Like Con- well, here's a poster. Hear them darkies singing. Mm. Yeah. Right. That's what I was you know, come and watch them play and listen to them clown. Clowning was a tradition even then. Okay. Then with William Clarence Matthews, when he played in 1905 up here, the, there was a player on the Montpelier team who had gone to Georgetown and boycotted games when Matthews played for Harvard. And he continued to boycott games up here and there was some support of him in Montpelier Berry. Uh, wow. So this, but the, the Vermont press was very much in support of, of Matthew. So I'm sure there was, but it didn't get reported much. So when the Cuban Gi- Giants would come to Burlington, they'd play um, a series of games, usually like three games, and they almost always managed to lose at least one game to the home team. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, th- this is a team composed of, of major league quality baseball players, but they always manage to lose at least one out of those three games to the locals. So, you know, I don't know. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it was good business, I'm Marketing. sure. Marketing. Marketing, yes. yes. Now, while we're on the subject of the Cuban giants who weren't actually Cuban, I think it's worth mentioning that there were – Cuban barnstorming teams during this era. But instead of calling themselves the Cuban Giants, they always called themselves the Cuban Stars or some variation on that name, uh, such as the All Cubans, the Havana Cuban Stars, the New York Cubans, or the Cincinnati Cubans. And uh, these, again, were, were you know loaded with guys who you know were some Hall of Fame caliber players like Cristobal Torriente and, and uh, oh, well, Mendez. He's, 
uh, Minnie Minoso is several decades later. And not in the we're, 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 he played for the Cubans. Yes, he did. Yes, he played for the New York Cubans in the Negro Leagues, in the and Negro League yeah. era that were almost. I wonder if our audience can see that. That painting by Lance Rick oh, Burke is also here. Yeah, so um, it's worth it's worth I think pointing out that uh, Graham brought this beautiful uh, watercolor of Minnie Minoso taking a, a, a swing at a spring training park in the 1950s with the Chicago White Sox, and it was done by our friend Lance Richburg. Um, Very famous the, baseball the, the great, great the great baseball uh, painter. painter. Yes, that's Miami. Oh yeah. yeah. I played in one of them parks there with the dome. It is Miami. You recognize that tree? It, I recognize <laughs> the stands, how they went back. There was a big dome over the top of it to protect it from the rain behind it. It looked like a, like uh, where they put the blimps, you know, underneath. It was, it was all like stainless steel or something. And just because Lance is very uh, humble, it's worth noting that his father played in Havana, Cuba. Right. Uh, in 1921, 28, when it was the first game ever of their uh, magnificent new baseball stadium. Yeah. In Havana. In Havana. Yeah. yeah. Lance's, Lance's dad was a, was a lifetime 300 hitter uh, with the Boston Braves and Chicago Cubs, Washington Senators. And his portrait hangs in Cooperstown, sliding into third. And I sit underneath it every time I go there. And I sit next to my Aunt Annabelle's shoes. And just so the audience at, at home can see, there's Lance. Lance is the best baseball artist in the country. Yeah. With maybe the exception of Kadir Nelson, who did the New Yorker, wow. New Yorker, yeah, that was, that, that George was, Floyd. Yeah, was, yeah. Same, he's much more representation. George Floyd? During that time. You know who did my portrait? Tommy McDonald. The football player? The football player. Really? The smallest Hall of Fame football player had the single bar, and he's a portrait artist. Huh. Didn't know that, did you? I had no oh, idea. Let me get it. <laughs> All right, so down. we've now covered three of my four takeaways. My fourth is when we talk about the Negro Leagues, what we're really talking about are the Negro Major Leagues that existed from 1920 to 1948. In fact, as of December 2020, Major League Baseball has now officially recognized seven of the Negro Leagues as Major League, and their statistics are now part of the official record of Major League Baseball. Um, now, the first of these major Negro, uh, major Negro Leagues was organized by a fellow by the name of Rube Foster uh, in 1920. Rube Foster was the owner of the Chicago American Giants, one of those great barnstorming teams. He finally came up with the plan to pull together some of these teams in a league format and uh, was fairly successful with what he called the Negro National League, um, which was based mostly in the Midwest, actually exclusively in the Midwest, and it lasted until 1931. Its dominant teams were, of course, his own, the Chicago American Giants, but they also had the Kansas City Monarchs and the St. Louis Stars, which had uh, you know many great ball players during this era, Cool Papa Bell, um, Buck O'Neill. He came a little bit later. Did he? Um, but uh, but um, Bullet Rogan played for Kansas City in that era. Um, so you know these were these were you know top-notch teams. So at around that same period in 1923, because these teams were all located in the Midwest, the same thing happened in the East. In 1923, the Eastern Color League sprang up, and it lasted until 1928. Its dominant teams were the Hilldale Club, which was based just outside of Philadelphia, the Harrisburg Grays, um, which had the great ball player Oscar Charleston, and the Atlantic City Backrack Giants, who um, uh, had um, the um, uh, great shortstop uh, Pop Lloyd for a while, and then later um, Dick Lundy, another great shortstop. And throughout the 1920s, this period of the, of, of the first uh, Negro National League and the uh, Eastern Colored League, most, well, I don't know about most, but a lot of the Negro League ballplayers would spend their winters playing professionally down in Cuba. That was a very common thing. And, um, and Puerto Rico? Or just no, just, just pretty much Cuba at this point. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there were some players from, from Puerto Rico and the Dominican who came and played in that same mm -hmm. league in Cuba, um, but, but there was only four teams in that league. Uh, and they were all kind of right outside of Havana, but uh, but um, 
they had a very uh, successful, you know, it, it lasted for decades, mm -hmm. that Cuban Winter League. Um, so we've got a league in the, in the West, or really the Midwest now, but considered the West back then, and a team in a uh, league in the East, so it was natural for them to come together and hold a Negro World Series, which they did in the 1920s. And, and, uh, and you know, when you, when you look at the Negro League World Series, it was a little different than the World Series in white baseball. In white baseball, for the most part, it's been a best of seven series where the teams, um, uh, you know, play half the games in the American League Park and half the games in the National League Park. And, you know, whoever gets the seventh game, I mean, that depends on, you know. Can't divide seven and a half. Right. But uh, anyway, um, the Negro League World Series was a little different. They would play wherever the money was. So, you know, it doesn't matter who, who the best team was from the, the uh, Negro National League or who the best team was in the Eastern Colored League. They would play in Baltimore and they would play in Pittsburgh and they would play in Chicago and they'd play down in St. Louis and they'd just move around get wherever, the gate. They, wherever they could get the gate. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, also, you have to understand, these teams didn't own their own parks. Only one team, the Pittsburgh Crawfords in the 1930s, owned their own park. So they played where they could play. And most of the time, these teams played uh, in the white major league parks wow. when the white team was away. So when he, uh, did they play in the South? Uh, Birmingham had, or Birmingham and Atlanta, the Atlanta Black Crackers. Black Crackers. The Birmingham <laughs> Black Barons uh, were were in one or two of these major leagues. Yeah. But generally, they avoided the South. They avoided the South. Yeah. Okay, um, so it's also worth mentioning that um, the owners of many of the teams were, uh, they got their money from the numbers racket, which was essentially an illegal lottery. Um, that's where these magnates who had enough money to you know, own the teams made their money, kind of illegal, uh, well, was illegal. And, uh, and so, you know, there was always this kind of interesting relationship between baseball players and organized crime and entertainers, you know, like the great jazz musicians. They all hung out in the same bars. And they all, you know, went to the same nightclubs. And, you know, there's a kind of this romantic uh, image of, of, you know, all these, these groups coming together, you know. And, and, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to, the, so what ended up causing these leagues, these first, these first attempts to form organized leagues to disband Lack of competition. Yeah. There was a lot of jumping back and forth. And of course, whenever a team had money, they would get all the stars and they'd run away with the league and no, you know, nobody else had a chance. And then people would stop going to the games because it was just a, you know, it was just a route. And, and you know, uh, it's too bad they didn't have like a salary cap or something, although I'm sure they, <laughs> they, they would have uh, found ways to work around that. Um, but, you know, that's, that's really one of the things about professional sports or sports in general that, you know, if you don't have good competition, nobody wants to go see it. Yeah. You know, if, if you got to have some, some semblance of parity or some, you know, at least hope for the other teams. And, and, you know, towards the end of the 1920s, you know, the St. Louis Stars were 40 games ahead by, you know, July. And, you know, some of the teams would just end up saying, how oh, the heck with it, we're going to pack it in. Or, you know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of... Um, it, the Negro Leagues were, were, were kind of loosey-goosey, you know? Players would jump from team to team. They didn't worry about contracts. Um, uh, teams would disband, and then they'd form in, in another city. And, you know, there was, um, there was not as much um, stability as in the white major leagues. There's, there's irony in the fact that the best team in the American League East is – played in St. Petersburg in a terrible ballpark, Florida. and they don't draw. Yeah. They only draw Yankee fans and Red Sox fans. Yeah. It's because you're not allowed out of your house unless your age matches the temperature. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just made that up. Okay, so, uh, so the, the... It's interesting because they were talking about moving that team up back to Montreal. 50% oh, of the games, yeah, yeah but... It would be the same deal. Oh, it'd be tough. How does your wife, you're down there, your kids are in school. Well, actually, it would be. If they gave you a camp on a lake for your ball player 
and brought him to Montreal and stayed in St. Sever or St. Anne, to, you know, and then you came down together to the ballpark. It'd be, we could work this out. That's, That's a great idea. It's a, and think, why, who wants to be in St. Petersburg when it rains at 4 o'clock? Batting practice is a, I mean, it's, it doesn't happen. It rains at 4 o'clock every afternoon down there. Yeah. And they have to cover their stadium. I bet you the teams in Florida do not draw. Well, that's, that's for darn sure. So yeah. That's documented at this point. Tampa Bay, is, Tampa Bay and Miami is yeah, both. They, they, they don't yeah. draw flies. Terrible. The only, the only stadium worse than that was Olympics. <laughs> well, Olympic. It was, it was, it was built for the Olympics. Yes, correct. You know, it, was, uh, it wasn't covered. And well, who was the guy that hit the home run that went out of the ballpark? And then Kingman. Kingman. And then they had to put the, the, the lines. lines up there. And you, when you look up, you got vertigo because it was an ellipse. And I like pitching there because the shadow would come down and you could actually throw the ball out of the shadow being a left-hander because the hyperbole that came down that way. And I, I like Montreal. But it's a great city. Great yeah. city. And they took it away. Why did they take it away? Baseball? Why'd they take baseball away from Montreal? I don't know. Yeah, so, you know, this is, this is kind of, we haven't gotten to this is point. Is that rhetorical? Yeah. No, I know why they took it away. Um, I think Charles Brofman's, his, his, what was his, oh, what, what was his name? He was the second in command, and Charles gave it up because Gary Carter bit, on a contract dispute, bit the hand of Brofman, and Brofman, severed all ties and gave it to his second in command and his second in command took all the extra money after they got rid of Carter to the Mets and he didn't reinvest it in the baseball program and that's why the, the league took it away from yeah. him. Yeah. Huh? So getting back to Negro League history yeah. and, and, and kind of jumping ahead in, in chronology, um, I think it's worth mentioning at this point that Montreal played a very prominent Right. role in the history of, of um, oh, yeah. blacks integrating Major League Baseball. Um, it wasn't coincidence that when the Brooklyn Dodgers first signed Jackie Robinson in 1946, um, they sent him to play for the Montreal Royals, where they knew he would be better treated um, by the Canadian fans so up the there. the Montreal Royals were part of the Brooklyn Dodgers? They were from Triple A. They were the highest. Tommy team. Lasorda was the number one left-hander there. Mm -hmm. And they didn't bring him up. They brought Koufax up, and then Lasorda became disgruntled, but he became a great manager. So that's when, okay, I'm sorry, Tom. Yeah. No, it's okay. No, that's the history. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that since we were talking about Montreal. But getting back to that, um, the, the Negro, the first organized Negro Leagues in the 1920s. So I had mentioned that they'd gone out of business. One, one, the Eastern one in 1928, the Western one in 31. But in 1933, the Negro National League comes back again into existence. Historians call it the Negro National League II, but nobody called it at the that at the time. And it ended up lasting until 1948. It was dominated at first by the, a team called the Pittsburgh Crawfords, which, which Carl referred to, um, and, uh, and, and later by the legendary Homestead Grays, who were also based just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, although later in their history, they started playing games down in Washington, D.C. Uh, as well. They kind of had two home teams, one in, or two home parks, one in Pittsburgh and one down in D.C. Um, and then in 1937, the Negro American League comes into existence. That was the league that um, had a couple of the teams that Carl mentioned, um, uh, the Memphis Red Sox, the Birmingham Black Marins, <laughs> the Atlantic Black Crackers. Um, and, uh, and that league also lasted until 1948, and its dominant team was the Kansas City Monarchs, who of course, by that point, had the great Satchel Paige. Um, now, Satchel Paige, you know, we, you, you can't talk about the history of the Negro Leagues without talking about Satchel Paige. He pitched for just about every team in the Negro Leagues. <laughs> you know, he just bounced around wherever the money was. Oh. And uh, he'd, pitch a, he'd pitch a day game in Kansas City, and he'd drive to Chicago and pitch a night game in his Buick. And he was caught by an officer outside of Comiskey going, Satchel, this is a one-way street. He goes, officer, I'm only going one way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So, uh, so in the 1930s, which is, you know, really kind of like the heyday of the Negro Leagues, you've got the Negro American League, you've got the Negro National League, and the, the Major League Baseball has now started the institution of the All-Star Game. And so the Negro Leagues followed suit. They started holding an annual All-Star Game, and actually sometimes mm -hmm. a series of games um, in Chicago. And, and the Negro League All-Star Game became kind of like, um, like, like the place to be seen for the who's who of black America. You know, all the great black movie stars and musicians and entertainers and, you know, they all would come to Chicago for these baseball games. And boy, wouldn't it be fun to, yeah. you know, go back in history and, and see what that was like. Um, so so the, Negro, the Negro League All-Star Game, you know, became a very prominent event in the 1930s. Um, then in 1940, the richest man in Mexico, a guy by the name of Jorge Pascual, um, who was also dating Mexico's biggest movie star, a woman by the name of Maria Felix, funded an integrated Mexican league in an attempt to compete with Major League Baseball. He was getting all of the best black baseball players from the Negro Leagues and, and luring them down to Mexico with big contracts for big money. He'd, he'd supply them with you know, nice apartments. It was a great deal. And on top of everything else, Mexico had a much better attitude towards black uh, athletes than the United States did, um, and actually probably similar to Montreal, you know, in Canada. Yeah. He went out and got white ball players too. Yeah, he did. It was an integrated league, and they even had, you know, he went some and Mexicans. got Max Lanier from the St. Louis Cardinals. Right. Sal Magley. Huh? Yeah. Sal Magley. Sal Magley, and all of them got banned when they came back, and they wouldn't play, so they went to Canada and played in the summer up in Canada. Yeah. And made their money in the H and D league, in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Dick Gurnett, whole bunch of guys, a lot of Red Sox players. They all came back, though. Yeah, they all came back. Well, yeah. they eventually they, were, they Major League yeah. Baseball allowed them to come back, and and so they did. Um, but uh, but the Mexican League, again, you know, it must have been it must have been incredible to see all these these fantastic black players playing down there. They had Satchel Paige, Josh, Josh Gibson, Willie Wells, Roy Campanella, Monty Irvin. Everyone was down there. And, and Pasquale always stocked his hometown team, the Veracruz Blues, with the best of them. So they, they won the pennant almost every year because he pretty much dictated where the players went. And if they were losing, he'd move them <laughs> onto his own team. Wow. Yeah. So, so I had mentioned that, that um, the Negro National League and the Negro American League eventually folded in 1948. Of course, um, what caused their demise was the integration of, of white Major League Baseball. After Jackie Robinson came, a number of other, you know, the best of the Negro Leagues left the Negro Leagues to play in white organized baseball where they could make more money. Yeah, Minnie Minoso. Yeah, so that, that ended up pretty much being the death of the Negro Leagues. However, a few of these Negro League teams continued to exist, and they returned back to, you know, like kind of what goes around comes around. They go back to barnstorming, just like back at the, you know, 19th century and the early 20th century. Yeah, that's what Some I of did. the teams continued to exist, like the Indianapolis Clowns, which is the team that Hank Aaron played for briefly. Um, they continued to, you know, barnstorm around the country, and they would, oh, you know, they're called the Indianapolis Clowns because they would put on you know, kind of a comedy routine. They were, it was like the Harlem Globetrotters yeah, of, of baseball. Yeah, the Bingo-Long movie is about that period. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It is about that period. What is it? What movie? The Bingo-Long. Yeah. The irony is I had a barnstorming team because I was blackballed. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was blackballed by Major League Baseball. Why is that though? Oh, I, I have, let me count the ways. <laughs> let me, let me, but the thing is, I, and I found out that I was the last barnstormer in New England after Bernie Tebbets, who was born right down here by Handy's Grill. Yeah. Go figure. See, it, it is written. I got a letter once from Bernie Tebbets saying, I was born and raised in Winooski, and my wife was a secretary at St. Michael's. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. born on King Street. Yeah, bo yeah, he was actually born on King Street. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But he didn't want to be associated with the street, so he chose Winooski. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Williams, second white. Girl, he moved to Nashville. Yeah. 
He was a great guy. He took his old team and they had a bunch of black guys on the bus and they stopped at this place. They wouldn't let him eat. You know that story. Where's my uncle? Huh? I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, he stayed hard at it, by the way. Yeah. 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 I know that story. He was with Frank Robinson. Yeah. They were traveling on a bus. Yeah. Uh, across to their next game. They stopped at a local dive on the side of the road to get the team dinner. Yeah. And uh, they walked in, and of course, the you know, black players on the bus with, with Bernie and Frank, and the owner of the restaurant said, uh, yeah, You're allowed in. But uh, what the black flag, the, what the, restaurant was that? Some some guy on the side of the road, whatever they were talking about. In the about, south, yeah. Atlanta or somewhere. And Bernie said they're not allowed in. Bernie said, okay, no, no problem. He said, uh, I'll still take, you know, 380 hamburgers, wherever the order was, right? So they prepared the whole meal. They called Bernie back in to tell him to come and pick it up. But Bernie said, we're all set. We're leaving. <laughs> Just took right off. <laughs> That's the right story. I, did. I believe. I believe he took off before them sandwiches were done. Yes, yes. That was a story. Yeah. yeah, I would have been outside of Clayton County. Yeah. I would have been on the other side of the line. I wonder if um, anybody from our Zoom audience has any questions. Yeah, well, it's exactly 7 o'clock, so um, that's the end of my comments. So yes. let's just kind of open it up to general discussion. I'd like to make just a couple of, a couple of quick ones. Just, uh, Cuba, Cuba. Is especially interesting. Cuba's baseball history goes back almost as far as ours, and it's almost as glorious. The point is that from 19, early aughts to the 50s, uh, Cuba had the, the most prominent winter league. And major league, white major league baseball players were not making so much money that they didn't have to do, have a job in the winter. And if they could go down to Cuba and play and baseball, uh, uh, baseball, yes. But you have to understand, the color line had uh, many holes in it. And in mm -hmm. Cuba, White guys and black guys played against each other and even played on the same teams. And the Cubans had such, before Castro, had such a wealth of talent that they came up and played in, in the United States during the summer. Mm -hmm. Now about 40 white Cubans, and there are white Cubans descended mm -hmm. from Spanish uh, people. Uh, Jose Canseco, for example, is Cuban. Castellano, the, the lighter your skin, yeah. the and, more uh, Castilian you are. Yes, and so any number of uh, Rafael Palmero uh, would be would be qualified to play as a white guy, and over 200 black Cubans played in the Negro Leagues. And Bill has alluded to to uh, Louis Tiant's dad Senior, played yeah. for the New York Cubans. So Cuba is a fascinating yeah. history of race of race. Right. The other thing I'd mention is it's interesting um, that uh, this East West game. If I could do one, if I could travel in time and do one thing. I'd go to an East-West game. They were always played in Chicago. They were always played in Comiskey Park. And in the 40s and late 30s, they had over 40,000, 40 to 50,000 fans there. So that was the All-Star game? The yeah. All-Star game was in August, and they put on trains from all over the country. It was a week-long party. And these players in, in the game were really something. So if these new world leagues hasn't, hasn't been you know, started, It, it certainly must have you know, jump started the timeline for, for the integration of the blacks to be playing, you know, major league baseball, right? I mean, it had to, it had to put pressure, right? As but the, the biggest issue integrating the game was World War II. Okay. Um, the logic of having people go fight against right. in the South Pacific against people of color and not allowing them, it, it, the color barrier was coming down. Okay. You're going to tell me a major league team two years after Jackie Robinson wasn't going to try to pick up Willie Mays? Right. So it was coming down. Ricky, Ricky got there first, and, and get, have it, you know, all credit to Ricky yep. and Robinson. And he reaped the benefits of it. And Roy Campanella, <laughs> he, yep. played, he, he played in the Negro Leagues at 15 for Baltimore. Yep. He was only 24 when the Dodgers signed him. They were coming. They were coming, mm -hmm. and there was no, no doubt about it. Quick other things is, in the 1920s, Chicago was the center of black baseball. In the 1930s, Pittsburgh was the center of black baseball. These two great teams that Tom, Tom wrote about. And in the 1940s, Kansas City was the center wow. of black baseball. The, Hall of, uh, baseball, the Negro Leagues Museum is in yeah. Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Now, that, so that, that decade of the 30s was the damn depression. So you want to know why these teams went out of business? They were never well financed. No. 
And, and the heyday of the Negro Leagues was in the, during the Depression. So you can just yeah. imagine uh, what the life, lifestyle was. Quick other thing is, Jackie Robinson takes all the air out of the room. Everybody thinks they understand baseball's integration because they know Jackie Robinson played in Montreal. They know that baseball's integration is fascinating. And it lasts all throughout the 50s as well. Mm -hmm. These teams brought them on one team at a time or one player at a time. Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood. And uh, imagine being a minor league player in the 1950s in the, in the Sally League, the South Atlantic League. They used the to Texas pick, League. yeah. They used to pick Kurt Flood's uniform out of the pile with a stick and wash it uh, separately, because yeah. they uh, didn't want to wash it with the white ball players. So Jackie Robinson's in Montreal in 1946 because Ricky thinks he needs a year. Of, he didn't. He led the league in hitting and everything else, but he also got acclimated to playing in white baseball. So it's hard to know that Bill Veck brought his players on the next day because right. they were qualified. And uh, but there were two other fronts of the integration of the baseball by the Dodgers. And the one that fascinates me is Nashua, New Hampshire. Because mm -hmm. when Jackie's in Montreal, Campy and Don Newcomb are in Nashua. And Newcomb was there another year, it was 19 and four. He was ready too. So, uh, and then there was a third front that I'm gonna get interested in doing next year when I can cross the border, which was in, uh, I grew up in Lewiston, Maine, and my, my best, friends, wow. the best friend's parents were from Tree River. Juan Riviere, right? Juan Riviere was the third front of integrated baseball because the two Dodger pitchers that played for Montreal and then were demoted uh, in 1946 played in Tree River and Juan Riviere, and there's a stadium that they played in that's still up there. He had four home runs in that stadium. Really? He had a doubleheader. Stoned out of my gourd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why did you get black ball, Phil? Huh? <laughs> Dave? I crossed over. Hey, that was amazing. Bill, you know, the history is great, but you actually played in the 70s, 80s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, without getting into individual stories or you know anything, but how prevalent was racist, racism in that era when you mm -hmm. played and what you witnessed, what you saw? I, I think it would be fascinating to you know, well, just get your perspective on what you actually witnessed as a The teacher. KKK was in Auburndale, Florida, which is just outside of Winter Haven, Florida. And they had the Elks Club. And at the Elks Club, they served steak and everything on Saturday nights to the ball players, except George Scott and Tommy Harper. Mm -hmm. And they both complained to the Red Sox. And they're in the clubhouse, and I told them, you know, Tommy, and George was there. I said, George, I said, the only way you'll ever be served at the Elks Club is if you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> they go, Billy, you can't say that. I go, oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> Boom, case dismissed. So here I am. I'm down there in Auburndale, and I'm rowing around Bob Veal in a phosphate pit in a John boat. He weighs 260 pounds. He's at the back of the boat. I'm all tipped up in front. I'm rowing him around, and all these crackers are out there bass fishing. <laughs> I'm going, I used to put it in their face all the time down in the South. But I was player rep, so I had to, you so know. Even in the it was more yeah. down, the, in the down in the spring training. Hey, yeah. I'm in Montreal. I'm on the back of the plane. And John Milner, the hammer, goes, you know, Bill, you're the only white guy allowed on the back of the plane. And I go, John, I'm not white. I'm from California. You just have more melanin in your skin than I do. <laughs> I, I wanted to say something about Cuba before we have to close, and that is that Tom Simon um, was in charge and did a whole program where the Cuban American Friendship Society worked with Tom to bring a uh, little league team, although that wasn't his official name, right? We had some trouble about that, to Cuba where our kids from this area of the country played a Cuban team in Cuba. And it was the only second time since 1959 that they played the Star Spangled Banner, I guess, at, wow. at the stadium. Did you know that? I don't think I knew that. And the first time they played the Star Spangled Banner, because you know the relations between Cuba and the United States have been fractured since Fidel Castro took over the leadership of Cuba and the, with his Communist Party in 1959. It was the first time um, that I think that this exchange of teams had happened since 1959. And Tom Simon 
was key in bringing that team to Cuba, and I hope you had a good experience. Oh my gosh, they were but, so great to us, Andy. I know, but I have to say one other thing. So the, we, that was the second time they played the Star Spangled Banner. The first time was when Obama went. Which was and only a week or two before us. It was right. only a month before Tion us. Tion was at that game. Louis yes, Tion. Yes, he was. Yeah. Louis yeah. was at that game. And so that's how important Cuba is. When we when we um, when we played um, played there two weeks after the I think it was the Baltimore Orioles were there, um, the Cuban Baseball Federation had the same groundskeepers and umpires and announcers come do our you know youth games that had done. The, the major league game, the Orioles game, like a couple weeks earlier. It's, a, it's an amazing the Cubans, experience. The Cubans were gracious. Oh my oh. gosh, it was unbelievable. After the game and before the game, they didn't they didn't throw too many games. No, oh yeah, no, they didn't. They didn't. They did not um, allow us to come even close to winning a single game. <laughs> I thought they mixed it up at the end. At the end, we did. We mixed the teams together. That because we were supposed to play the. Uh, Cuban, the uh, Havana province team, you know, like the provincial all-star team of all these clubs that have been beating us so badly. You know, this is going to be their all-star team and we we're going to play them on the last day. And they said, well, let's just like put the two teams together. We'll mix them up. And, and that was actually the best, that was the best game that we had. It was really fun. And Sandy, they came here afterwards. Excuse me, I'm sorry to here. interrupt. Can you no, all take no, a question from the chat? Oh, we got a, we've got a, we've got a question from the chat yeah. room. Can you... Uh, Oh, yeah. I can read it to you. Okay. Someone would like to know why there are so few African Americans playing in the major leagues today. Ooh. Well, they play basketball. I can tell you why. Yeah. Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> one, two words. One word. Michael Jordan. Because <laughs> they 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 get more money in the inner city. They all play basketball. Baseball is a game of failure. It's a game where if you get three hits in 10 at bats, you failed seven times, and you got the chance to go to the Hall of Fame. Kids can't handle failure. That's why Little League is so well. More people play Little League yeah. than any other sport on the world, yet they don't make the transition at 13 years of age because it's a difficult game, and it's a game of tolerating failure. In basketball, you know, you shoot 50% and everything else, and they all high-five you now and everything, and baseball is difficult. What about football also? Well, they, I mean, the reasons, I think, are cultural. They're right. not racial. The game is, has more, peop, more players of color than it ever has. Now, black has become ca a word that's capitalized, and it's an ethnicity now. It's African-American. Yeah. So there are only seven, between 7 and 8% African-Americans in the major league. But the game is more diverse by color than it's ever been. So it's cultural in basketball and football after college scholarships. Yeah. And there are a dozen other reasons. It's economic, well, economic too. Well, I think David Ortiz wouldn't be considered. No, I, 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 I say that all the time. He's, he's Red Sox black. have no, no black know. players. None now? No, but they got six or seven who couldn't have played in the, in the, in the major leagues when it was segregated. They got six or seven players of color, dark-skinned players, uh -huh. yeah. but no African Americans, and that's it. that's true throughout the game. So it's complicated. It's so e is it economic. To say though that Latin Americans play in baseball, right? A lot, they have, a lot of Latin players play. Right. Not a lot of Latin. Well, who knows? Nobody that's the only way to get out of the Dominican Republic. Latin they have the schools down there. They make their gloves out of paper mache. They don't even have leather. Uh, Tony, what's the guy for the, Tony Fernandez. Fernandez. They called him El Cabeza because he had a big head, but his first glove was all made out of paper mache. Yeah. And they teach milk him. Cartons. To, exactly, milk, milk cartons. cartons and stuff that he would blend together. And yeah. that's, it's economics. Every problem you can look at. I, I don't look at it in terms of race. I don't look at it in terms of anything else. It all goes back to Eugene Debs. The fact that he was in jail right. and he ran for president and he was, he was a uh, pacifist and... And a socialist. And a socialist. Well, exactly. And the, fact that, and the fact that we took a guy who was a racist president named Wilson right. and we went to Europe. And if we don't go to Europe and fight World War I, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. All right. So any other questions from That's our... Uh, <laughs> that wraps up the Negro, 
Negro Leagues history. <laughs> How did we get? Because it's economic, stupid. It's all about money. Other questions yeah. in the chat? It doesn't look like it. Um, okay. I think we scared them away. All right. So I think well, we've also run out of time. If anybody has any, I wanted to commend though this whole team of baseball historians, and I really want to emphasize what great work Tom Simon has always done in terms of writing books about baseball, and also getting that team into Cuba. I can't tell you how moving it was for anybody who loves Cuba. It was really great. So, thank One of the you. highlights of my and life. And thank you, Bill Lee, for being here. And also for Workers Bill of the Lee. world unite. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, Thanks. Thank Thanks, everyone at home. Well,